Welcome back, folks, to my WrestleRant video series where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch on the WWE Network. Last time I talked about the 2004 installment of Taboo Tuesday. Today I'll be talking about the 2005 installment of Taboo Tuesday, the second and final installment of this pay-per-view before transitioning to Cyber Sunday, which I'll be talking about in future videos. But kicking off the show is a tag team match, Pelea, where the fans got to choose the tag team opponents for the team of Edge and Chris Masters. It was either Matt Hardy, Rey Mysterio, let me look at here in the polls, uh, Matt Hardy, Rey Mysterio, JBL Christian, or Hardcore Holly. Hardy and Rey Mysterio obviously winning the poll here, the only two faces in the entire poll. Um, this would also be notable for Christian's final WWE appearance as his contract expired the night prior on Halloween, October 31st, but he fulfilled his contractual obligations by appearing on the show even though he wasn't chosen. So that being said, um, it was a very good match, but instead of Edge being participating in the match, he replaced himself with Schnitzky because he didn't want to come face-to-face -face with Matt Hardy, who he, would, who he had just eradicated from the Raw brand only a few weeks prior on the not the 15th anniversary show. It was their Raw homecoming when they went back to Monday Night Raw on the USA Network. So Edge pulled himself out of this contest. He didn't really have the power to do so. So the fact that he even did that was a bit illogical and weird. I was really looking forward to him and Masters tag teaming together. And more so looking forward to Edge and Hardy interacting together because they always have great matches. But the fact that he pulled himself outside of, you know, in place of Schnitzky wasn't... I mean, it, was, it played in character with his heel shtick, but... Even still, I don't, like from a storyline standpoint, couldn't the general manager at that time could have just put him in the match because he was obligated to be in the match? It didn't make much sense, but it made sense from a storyline standpoint in terms of Edge being a heel and whatever. It was still a very good match. I've got about 14 minutes. Uh, Matt Hardy and Rey Mysterio go over, proving that SmackDown is the superior brand in this contest. So a very good matchup to kick off the show. Up next, we had Eugene and Jimmy Superfly Snuka, a tag team partner of the WWE Universe is choosing. It would end up being Snuka. Um, taking on the team of Rob Conway and Tyson Tomko, a very random tag team. So Eugene, always obsessed with the Legends, it was kind of a cool stipulation for him to have a Legend be chosen as his tag team partner. It was either Snuka, Jim Duggan, or Kamala. Um, Snuka taking away the poll with 43%, just a little bit higher than Jim Duggan at 40%, and Kamala only getting 17 but um, even still, though, a very fun tag team match. It didn't last very long. I think it went about six or seven minutes. Um, but it was still fun to see Eugene interact with the, the legendary Jimmy Superfly Snuka, who still, at, who still has it at his age. Like I said, the tag team of Rob Conway and Tyson Tomko, very random. They were just kind of the job guys for Eugene. It was pretty obvious who was going over here. But still fun to see Jimmy Superfly Snuka, nevertheless. So up next, we had Mankind taking on Carlito in a match where the fans got to choose which face of Foley we got to see. It was either Mankind, Dude Love, or Cactus Jack. Mankind taking away the pole. So Mankind taking on Carlito, who was still kind of like an up-and-comer at the time. WWE still obviously had faith in him at this point in time. It wouldn't be until 06, 07 where they really stopped pushing the guy, and that kind of pissed me off because I think he had a lot of untapped potential. But nevertheless, though, um, very good match here. Didn't go all that long. It was only about seven or eight minutes. Mick Foley would come back for, you know, little matches like this every once in a while against Carlito, against Edge, not earlier this year. That was, I think, the next year, WrestleMania 22. So Mick Foley wasn't officially retired yet. He was still semi-retired. So for him to come out of retirement as Mankind, of all people, was very, very cool. Fun tag team match. Carlito got some offense in. But in the end, Mankind forced Carlito to submit. Uh, via the Mr. Sacco. So a good match there. Up next, we had Big Show and Kane taking on Lance Kane and Trevor Murdoch for the World Tag Team Championships. Now, this may sound familiar, but like I said in my 04 review of Taboo Tuesday, it was a very same, very similar scenario in that Big Show, Kane, and Shawn Michaels were all in the poll to be voted to be the number one contender to John Cena's WWE Championship that night to be inserted in the triple threat match with him and Angle. And of course, Shawn Michaels... Far and away the winner of that poll. Much like the year before, Shawn Michaels was voted to face Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship the year prior. This year he's voted to face John Cena for the WWE Championship. So obviously it goes, it's a testament to how popular Shawn Michaels was, is, and forever will be. But anyway though, the losers of that poll, much like the year before, were given a World Tag Team title shot. Big Show and Keane, unlike Chris Benoit and Edge though, these two were actually on the same page. Dominated Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch. Um, to, to win back the to win the world tag team championships, and thus embarking on a very dominant reign as tag team champions before dropping them back to who did they drop them to? Oh, the Spirit Squad in April of 2006. So they would hold these belts for approximately six or seven months. So a uh, very dominant match, very dominant showing from Big Show and Kane. 
And unlike, I mean, these do have good chemistry too as big giants. So at least that kind of worked for them well too. But um, yeah, the match wasn't really anything special. It's just kind of a dominant showing for Big Show and Kane, new World Tag Team Champions. Up next, Jonathan Coachman to take on. Um, I think it. Let me see what the stipulation was here. I forgot what it was. It was stipulations for Batista's fight against Jonathan Coachman. I think initially it was supposed to be Stone Cold Steve Austin, which they acknowledged on the show, but Austin had to pull out at the last minute due to some injury or something like that. So he had to pull out. So Batista, I think who was the World Heavyweight Champion at that time, was put in his place. The stipulation for this matchup was either, was either a street fight, verbal debate, or arm wrestling match. I think you can pretty much guess which one won here. Street fight with 91% of the votes. Um, and of course, Vader and Goldust making their respective return to WWE to come in the corner of Jonathan Coachman to come to his aid during this contest. But despite their strongest attempts to make Jonathan Coachman win, he would still come up short against the World Heavyweight Champion Batista. But like I said, a fun matchup, though. Uh, it was always fun to see Vader and Goldust back in the fold, if not for a very short, very period of time, but still very cool to see them nevertheless. So, um, yeah, it was only about a four- or five-minute match, Batista obviously going over. But even still, though, um, fun for what it was. And up next, the uh, annual, traditional, trashy, fulfill your fantasy matchup from WWE. I'll say it again, like I said in my last review, I'm not a big fan of these matches. I mean, I'll always, you know, be happy to see um, the Fulfill Your Fantasy matches with the costumes and stuff like that. That's always cool. But, I mean, I mean, it's always great for the male viewers like myself, but there's no wrestling in it. It's very hard to watch because a lot of these people are horrible wrestlers. At least we've got some better wrestlers in this one. And we had the whole um, angle going on with Mickey James and Trish Stratus at the time, with Mickey James being obsessed with Trish Stratus and helping her win here. So Trish Stratus, for the second year in a row, winning the Fulfill Your Fantasy Battle Royal, thus retaining her Women's Championship, much like the year prior. So like I said before, it was fun to see them on their get-ups and everything else, see them in the Fulfill Your Fantasy Battle Royal. But I mean, there's no wrestling there. It was a terrible matchup, and that's all I can really say for it. Up next, we had Ric Flair taking on Triple H in a steel cage match with Ric Flair's Intercontinental Championship on the line. One thing I really did not like about this matchup, and I mean, I can't remember what commentator, I think it was Michael, I don't know who it was, whoever was on commentary, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, one of them said that the IC title, despite it being on the line, no one gave two shits about the title being on the line. So that kind of devalued the prestige of the Intercontinental Championship, but I think someone else said that Ric Flair, it meant so much to him to win that championship at Unforgiving from Carlito, that it'd be, you know, disastrous for him to lose it to Triple H of all people, so... That sort of made it mean something, but for the most part, this match was not over the IC title. I mean, it was the IC title was defended, but that wasn't the main focus of this contest, and that kind of hindered it in the end, so it probably would have been better off not putting the title on the line. And they would have a rematch, I believe it's Survivor Series, in a last-minute standing matchup, and that matchup did not have the championship up for grabs, so it was a little less predictable, because you knew that Triple H wasn't going to win the IC title here. But even still, though, this was an excellent matchup. Much like with Randy Orton and Ric Flair, had a lot of great storytelling, a lot of blood, of course, <clears throat> as, in always, as in every Ric Flair matchup, especially in a hardcore contest such as this one, such as a steel cage. But um, a lot of storytelling, a lot of blood, a lot of great action. Ric Flair and Triple H have always worked well together, so I really enjoyed this matchup. I really enjoyed the history of the feud with Triple H coming back from injury, attacking Ric Flair, selling, saying that he's a shell of his former self. A lot of great stuff here. And, of course, Ric Flair barely escaped in the cage to retain his Intercontinental Championship. So, great, great matchup. I probably would have... Eh, maybe not, though, because this matchup went about 25 minutes. The main event... The main event went a little over 15. So I don't want to say I would have rather seen this matchup in the main event, because like I said in my 04 review, uh, the Steel Cage matchup took precedent over the World Heavyweight Championship contest. But if they're going to do this, then they should have given the World Title match more time. But even still, though, the main event comes along. It's John Cena versus Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels for the WWE Championship. It's going to be an instant classic whenever Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle are in the ring. This was no exception. Those two easily having one of the best feuds of 2005. A lot of great matches at WrestleMania, Vengeance, The Raw Homecoming, and the commentators made mention of that on this show, and that they were tied one for one. Still had yet to prove who was the better man. So a lot of great chemistry and action between all three of these former guys. And John Cena throw him into the mix as well. People are still saying at this point in time that John Cena can't wrestle. I differ. I, I beg to differ. I would rather say, I'm not the biggest John Cena fan, but in my personal opinion, I think he's a very good wrestler, regardless of who he's in the ring with. But um, that's just my opinion, though. A lot of people will disagree, but that's just my opinion. 
Anyway, though, very, very good matchup. My only complaint, like I said before, is that I wish it would have gotten more time. But in the end, John Cena proving supreme to retain his WWE Championship and embarking on one of the longest WWE title reigns in recent WWE history. Um, not as long as his reign from 07, but still pretty long nevertheless because he would go on to drop it to Edge and New Year's Revolution, and the rest is history. But even still, though, a very good way to go off the show with a very great matchup and a very, very good matchup between Cena, Michaels, and Angle, as well as a steel cage matchup between Ric Flair and Triple H. So two blockbuster main events. And on the whole, I really enjoyed this show a lot more than I did the 04 show. I thought the 04 show was decent. It had its you know matches to go out and watch for. But I thought this show was a lot more fun, a lot more interactive, really, really cool. I mean, all these Cyber Sunday Taboo Tuesday shows are interactive, so to speak, because they involve the WWE Universe and all the voting and whatever else. But even still, though, um, whether it's rigged or not, it's always interactive. But even still, um, I thought this was a very, very good show. Big improvement over the Taboo Tuesday 04 installment with a lot of good matches. So matches from this show, I would suggest you go out of your way to watch. The opening matchup I thought was very, very fun between Rey Mysterio, Matt Hardy, Chris Masters, and Schnitzky. Um, Mankind making a return to take on Carlito. Fun match for what it was if you're a fan of Mankind, the whole gimmick and the attitude era or whatever else. That was fun. New World Tag Team Championships crown. New, New World Tag Team Champions crown, excuse me. Um, Batista making a special appearance on a Raw show to take on Jonathan Coachman. What was a fun street fight. Also marked the returns of Vader and Goldust. Um, the Battle Royal was complete shit. I mean, that goes without saying. And then Ric Flair, Triple H, Cena, Angle, and Michaels having two great matches on this show. Two awesome main events. So those two alone are worth watching this pay-per-view. But uh, the rest of the card is pretty uh, solid as well. So replay factor, yes, I would suggest to you that you go back and watch the show. Very, very good show. A lot of fun. And uh, definitely better than some of the more recent Cyber Sunday shows, which I'll get into in upcoming editions of Russell Rant in coming weeks. So with that being said, thanks for watching, folks. Always appreciate it. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be back in a couple more days with my review of the 2006 installment of Cyber Sunday. Until then, I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys then.